Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Andy Tsao. I'm a managing director at Silicon Valley Bank. And as uh, Terry uh, stated, I manage our uh, global gateway business. What is that? It's our team that's doing uh, business development in a new and emerging technology hubs around the world where we see both rising uh, tech entrepreneurship uh, and then um, inflows of international capital. So the markets that we've been focused on include Latin America, that's kind of Brazil, Mexico mostly, India, uh, and uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, last year, uh, we took the opportunity uh, for the first time to get to know the MENA region more, and that took us to uh, Dubai twice. Uh, really excited to see what's happening there firsthand. Um, and as our work is really building bridges uh, on both sides, um, here in the Bay, we got to know Tekwadi, so I'm really excited to be here at uh, my first Tekwadi summit and uh, being part of the conference. Uh, for those of you who don't know SVB, we are the bank for the uh, innovation economy effectively. Uh, we work with more than half of the uh, venture-backed tech companies across the U.S. and probably about 60% of the uh, venture capital firms. Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. My name is Ramzi. Um, uh, really nice to see everybody today. Uh, Palestinian or American originally, um, uh, I spoke last year uh, when I was at a different job, actually. Um, so for the last 10 years, I've split my career between two funds, TA Associates and TCV, um, doing both enterprise software and consumer internet investing. Uh, I joined the, uh, this crazy place called the Vision Fund about six months ago um, to do some fun stuff we'll talk about uh, during the chat today, but really nice to see everyone. Hey everyone, my name is Ada Ahlawi, originally from Amman, Jordan. I was talking to Andy, and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it to dinner last night, but he told me there's a huge uh, representation from Amman, Jordan there. So uh, hello for everybody who's from that part of the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I started my career in Jordan in telecom startups, uh, supplying software for telecom providers. Uh, in 2008, went to Abu Dhabi, where I actually uh, joined Mubadala to help them build the semiconductor cluster that is supposed to build kind of an entrepreneurship platform, um, sort of like focused on semiconductor manufacturing, semiconductor design. Uh, 2011, I moved to uh, the US as part of the semiconductor business for Mubadala, which is Mubadala is a sovereign wealth fund for the government of Abu Dhabi for people uh, who don't know. And in 2016, we embarked with Mubadala on this journey of building a venture platform, a venture practice for Mubadala in Silicon Valley. Uh, spent two years trying to convince the leadership to really give us money. Uh, right now, we operate uh, two funds here in, uh, in the US. One is a $400 million direct investment fund focused on series A and B, and the other is a $200 million fund-to-fund uh, -fund, uh, business. We work closely with, with our colleagues and friends from SoftBank because also Mubadala funded SoftBank with $15 billion uh, in their vision fund, and um, our team also manages that relationship on behalf of uh, Mubadala. Awesome, thank you. So let's talk tech trends. Let's, uh, I would love to hear more about some of the trends that you each observed in 2018, and now that we are here in 2019, how some of those trends have, are going to translate that you expect to see in the coming year. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to start. I think uh, the answer really depends on the stage of investment because the tech trends that are feeding our funnel at a later stage are different. So if you look at series A and B trends of 2018, it was mainly, you know, it was hard to meet an entrepreneur that doesn't have machine learning in their pitch. Uh, because machine learning was really one of the most um, sort of like accelerating trends in, in 2018, uh, especially as it applies for certain verticals. So there was a wave called the smart enterprise wave, if, if, if you heard that term, in which every entrepreneur was trying to build leveraging machine learning, deep learning neural networks, um, you know, to disrupt traditional industries. And that was the main focus. Um, Part of that started, part of that wave started to impact biology and, and, and life sciences in, in early 2018. I see in 2019 that wave is gonna like even grow bigger and bigger. And um, you know, the integration of machine learning, you know, robotics, high throughput screening platforms, and how it impacts broadly life sciences and medicine, I think, is an area that's gonna be hugely disruptive in 2019 for our world. Um. Let me talk about two really quickly. One, why in, why in the world would anybody raise $100 billion for a fund in general? Um, so let me touch on that first, and then I'll, uh, I'll touch on kind of my personal focus. Um, 
So really quickly, why would someone raise 100 billion? I think the idea behind it is that Masa, about 20 years ago, saw the US internet wave that was kind of happening, given he was in the telco and the software distribution indus industries. Um, his problem was that um, he didn't have enough money to invest behind it. And for the most part, he would kind of self-admit that he missed the US internet wave in the early 2000s and late 90s. Um, so it's kind of fooled me once, missed it there. He saw it happening kind of five, six, seven years later in China. Um, and a lot of you guys may have read about um, a small investment he made in Alibaba that, you know, $100 million turned into $100 billion, plus or minus $20 billion, something like that. Um, and so obviously very successful investment. Um, but his self-criticism was that he didn't go all in in China internet or uh, China, kind of the wave of China technology about 10 years ago. And, you know, frankly, if you look at from today's perspective with the way the Chinese economy, especially in the technology side, has gone, if he had gone all in China 10 years ago, you know, Alibaba may be one of 20 things that he might have invested in. Um, so the third kind of part of this is, you know, missed the first trend, saw the second trend but didn't have enough money. Now he feels that AI, broadly speaking, over the next 10 years will be a part of everything that we do, um, not in the cheesy kind of, you know, ro straight robotic sense, but uh, embedded in kind of our lives through software and technology. And so he tried to raise as much money as possible behind that, thanks to Mubadla and, and kind of other investors. Um, and that's the broad kind of theme behind the fund and why that much money was raised. Uh, my personal interest, I help lead the software group, um, and so we're focused on enterprise software investing. Broadly speaking, automation is a big, big theme. Um, again, not automating people out of jobs, but increasing productivity kind of at the site of work. So a lot of manual tasks, manual labor, um, getting that out of the workflow and, and allowing people to focus on you know, more important tasks during their day. That was our first investment in the fall. Um, so, two quick themes from our perspective. Well, both, both, of, you, both of you and your firms have uh, done a lot to really evolve the entire industry. Um, and maybe from a more generous uh, perspective, uh, I'll, I'll sort of put my comments to put some context behind uh, some of these tech trends. And um, for the, have, have folks seen sort of the 2018 um, venture uh, numbers that came out like last week or 10 days ago? Uh, for those who haven't, um, 130 billion was invested in U.S. venture last year, and that you know smashed the last uh, high watermark, which was about 105 billion way back in the year 2000. We all kind of know what happened after the year 2000. We won't go there. Uh, if you want to come back to that, Terry, we we can talk more about that. Um, but uh, certainly, in in an environment where that there's that much liquidity. Um, there are a lot of things that were kind of up and to the right, uh, as you might imagine. So, uh, for example, the number of mega funding rounds uh, that were completed, the amount of corporate venture that was invested, the amount of private equity, hedge, sovereign wealth uh, that came into the, uh, into the uh, industry last year, every, everything was uh, up and to the right. Um, uh, similarly, um, uh, when you, uh, a few of the trends that we've seen over the last couple of years uh, sort of continued, right? Uh, I mentioned the, the mega round, so you actually had uh, a fewer number of deals. This has happened sort of sequentially over the last couple of years now, but the amount of capital obviously was, was much, much bigger. And so that, again, suggests the power of uh, really large um, funding rounds. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, the, the, that's some of the context there. I, I think within the, the numbers, uh, sort of or confirming uh, some of the areas that these guys uh, are, are active in. Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, certainly received a lot of investment over the course of last year. Um, Ala and I were talking about uh, life sciences, both in terms of healthcare, IT, uh, but then uh, biopharma continue to do uh, really well uh, in, in terms of funding last year too. And I think those areas will continue to see a lot of investment this year. So you each touched on machine learning and artificial intelligence at, at one point. Is this now an expectation when you guys see pitches? Like, if a company is not focusing heavily on machine learning in some capacity, do you view that as a disadvantage? Um, I mean, not necessarily. It really depends. I think um, the, the, the reason why most companies focus on that is because data accessibility and data aggregation is becoming cheaper and cheaper and easier. 
to collect these data and like kind of consolidate in one piece. A majority of this data is actually resides, like for enterprises, majority of, these, of this data just resides somewhere on a repository that nobody really touches. And a lot of people are trying to leverage that, right? And in order for you to make sense of like those large amounts of data, you need machine learning. And, and, and that is a trend that's coming, right? And, and, and it has been forming for a while. Is it an expectation? Not really. Like, like we look at companies, especially like are in biotech, so you know, traditional life science approach that doesn't necessarily leverage machine learning. So it really depends on the sector. But if anybody wants to you know, make enterprises efficient by leveraging this data, then yeah, machine learning right now is a standard way of, of kind of leveraging this data. Maybe just to really quickly add on to that, I mean, um, before I joined SoftBank, um, when I was at TCV, I'd done a lot of consumer internet investing in, you know, um, businesses that we would all know. The, f the fund more broadly was in Spotify, Netflix, Airbnb, and other ones. Um, but uh, more specifically, I think, to the mach machine learning question, I mean, even in consumer internet, in kind of standard, you know, what you think is a regular business, um, the size of the data science or machine learning teams in the hundreds of individuals at some of these companies. And so even for entrepreneurs thinking about standard e-commerce or standard, you know, fill in the blank, the size of the tech team and the size of um, the data science team um, at the best companies is generally a forefront of where they're investing. Um, so one of the earliest questions I ask in kind of meeting someone is, hey, how many employees do you have? How many people are focused on tech and product? And you know, if you hear 200 employees, but we have 150 in sales and marketing and 20 tech and product, it's kind of a warning sign, uh, at least from our perspective, perspective of kind of where to spend time. So that's kind of how it's embedded throughout a lot of the companies that we see. Uh, I guess I would only add that uh, since we're just coming off a of CES, um, the, uh, the way that uh, artificial intelligence machine learning is playing out in some, uh, whether consumer devices or you know, certain digital homes was, was pretty ubiquitous. Robotics, uh, voice um, uh, enabled technology is certainly uh, huge all over CES. Awesome. Andy, do you want to talk a little bit more about um, the emerging markets and your experience of, of looking at trends in emerging markets and comparing it to kind of a lot of the information that you just talked about in terms of venture capital market here in the US? Sure. Yeah, well, um, you know, sort of as a starting point, thinking of last year was a banner year for venture in the US, it really um, was likely globally too. Though I don't think all the, the, the um, global numbers have come in yet. Um, you know, obviously China is in a little bit of a contraction right now, actually, but uh, at the second biggest venture market. Um, where we're, while the bank has a presence in China, my team is spending more time in, in um, uh, areas that we don't have physical presence, so it's kind of ex-China, if you will. Uh, but I would say um, that trend of sort of a rising tide in, in uh, venture funding is certainly uh, loud and clear in, in the emerging markets. Uh, so that's uh, both in terms of international funds uh, writing checks to scale up companies in these regions, uh, driving some of the acceleration of capital, that's certainly uh, that certainly uh, happened across the board. Uh, another uh, sort of angle of that growth for emerging markets um, gets talked about uh, here in the U.S. It, with kind of a U.S. lens when people talk about rise of the rest. Have people heard of that 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 terminology? That's uh, you know Steve Case, um, AOL founder, who's at Revolution Partners now, talks about how innovation doesn't necessarily have to come from Silicon Valley or or uh, you know hubs like Boston anymore. And I think those same themes are propelling uh, innovation globally. So we're seeing you know, a lot more funding, a lot more um, entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs that are really starting to make a difference. So, so that's pretty exciting. I think in terms of business models, you're still seeing the, the more mature companies being the uh, sort of scaling cut and paste models, if you will, or, or um, uh, clones, and where the innovation is really happening at the localization of, of the business. You know, good examples of that would be, um, you know, Kareem, for example, in Dubai, or Didi out of China, or 99 in Brazil, the ride-hailing apps. Um, looking at uh, some other other sectors that are getting funded this year within the transportation vertical, we've seen uh, the first ride share. The, sorry, the first bike sharing company uh, be funded in Brazil by some Chinese investors. 
very interesting sort of the emerging market to emerging market flavor. Uh, and then a, a bird-like company in, in Mexico called Grin uh, getting, uh, getting a large funding round as well. So those are uh, a few things that we're seeing in, 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 um, in the emerging markets. Great, thank you. Ramzi, let's talk about SoftBank. So obviously the Vision Fund is putting a lot of capital to work. How do you think that impacts the greater venture capital market? Um, but also specifically, how does that translate into some of the trends that you expect to see in 2019? Yeah, great question. Um, I think a couple of things. I mean, look, um, SoftBank itself, having, despite all the noise, has only really been around 18 months um, in kind of what it's been doing. And I liken it in a lot of ways to, call it about a decade ago when Andreessen Horowitz first started, um, and kind of how they in some ways blew up the Series A market, Series B market, and everyone kind of complained about what Andreessen was doing in terms of valuations. Um, but, so I would, I would liken kind of SoftBank a little bit to that um, in the kind of C, D, God knows the letters now have gotten so extensive, you're kind of halfway through the alphabet, but you know, um, in the later rounds, um, that's kind of where, um, where we've played. Um, but I think a couple of things. One, you know, a lot of folks talk about, you know, hey, you're deploying a lot of money in kind of a peak or what we all think is a peak in 2017, 2018 in terms of valuations. And um, I kind of go, I think that's exactly, it is probably a peak. Uh, but at the same time, um, I go back to one of my old bosses, Jay Hogue at TCV, who um, for 20 years has been an investor in Netflix. And funny enough, every time he, he's probably invested somewhere between 500 to 800 million dollars and has made many multiples off of that. Um, and every time he stepped into Netflix was at a point where every critic would think that the business was about to you know, be on a knife's edge or was about to fall off a cliff or something like that. And I think the interesting narrative, um, he also made a huge investment in Facebook in 2010, which as a lot of people, if you think back eight years ago, um, was not a straightforward investment. Um, there were a lot of other social apps that were out there. Um, the environment, everybody was talking about a double dip recession. There were a lot of things that were going on. But I think the one narrative to take out of those two stories is that the best businesses will generally survive macroeconomic cycles. And us as investors cannot time the markets, right? At the end of the day, um, unfortunately, our business is also AUM based. We don't get paid for not deploying capital and just sitting on it. Um, you're paid to deploy capital and hopefully be right with where you deploy that capital. And so our fundamental belief is that the best businesses, irregardless of cycle, will survive. The question is, are you hopefully smart enough to pick the best businesses or do you pick the wrong ones and you know, time the cycle wrong? Um, and so at least part of the reason why I jumped over to a place like the Vision Fund, which is you know, in all honesty still in its early days as it's, as it's uh, kind of figuring things out is that I felt the Vision Fund, at least in this environment, gives me the best access to those best companies. Um, and it's up to us to hopefully pick, pick and choose kind of which ones um, survive and which ones don't. But, uh, you know, just on that advice for entrepreneurs, I mean, I would say do not fret too much about cycles and cohorts and eight, is it 18 a better year to start or 19 or 20? It's like, hey, if you build a damn good business, it doesn't really matter what year you started in, so. Agreed. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience. So if you have any questions, um, be sure to consider thinking about that. Um, Allah, so I wanted to ask you uh, about healthcare and life sciences. So you mentioned that earlier. So what are some of the trends that you will be seeing, that you think that we'll be seeing more of in, in 2019? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think I'm going to give you just a, a little bit of stat, which is by year 2022, the pharmaceutical industry collectively is going to have 0% IRR on their R&D. That means the collective pharmaceutical industry is not going to make any money, right? And this is driven by two things. First is really driven by very long drug discovery cycle because people are still leveraging the old way of discovering drugs, which is pure biology and pure chemistry. And the other thing is clinical trials are really, really long and expensive. And uh, in order for you to get a drug on the market today, a pharmaceutical industry will spend $2 billion just to, just to get a drug, right? And you have 15 years, and this drug will be generic and could be sold for pennies, right? So it's a very tough industry. So the future, what I was focused on uh, in 2018, and half of Mobile Adventures portfolio actually is focused on that, which is how is technology going to enhance the front end of drug discovery in pharmaceuticals, right? 
And using machine learning, artificial intelligence, high throughput screening, alternative ways of drug discovery is a really critical field that could potentially impact this in a really positive way over the next five to 10 years. So th that is a trend that I see continuing in 2019, and it's a really important um, trend to watch. Um, the other, and, and why is it important? Because it's counter-cyclical as well. So a, a lot of people are worried about a downturn. Typically, healthcare investing is counter-cyclical, so it really follows the, the counter-cycle of, of tech investing, right? And, and can help uh, on a downturn actually focus on healthcare investments. The other trend is how can you really run more efficient clinical trials so that you can really bring the mar to technology to market and the product to market much faster. And that really with the amount of data and amount of very unique uh, populations that we have, we, we really need machine learning and artificial intelligence. So these two are very critical uh, trends on the pharma space that I think will impact 18, 19, and 20 investing. On the medicine, broad medicine is really the most important uh, trend to watch for is this idea of, again, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and how can it do clinical decision support for doctors, right? Because listen, we, we live in this country, I think we're very fortunate to have you know, amazing healthcare from a science and, and, and access to technology perspective. But you know, to read a, a, um, a radiologist or to have a radiologist in the middle of Africa or even some parts of the Middle East, right, is really ha hard to have that talent there, right? So how can you empower those um, pockets of, of populations with technology and really machine learning, artificial intelligence is the answer, to be able to help those doctors make proper clinical decisions at the right time of the diagnosis. These are the two major trends in life sciences that I believe will shape the next three years. Uh, the last thing that I would say is synthetic biology is something that we, we really cannot ignore. Uh, and um, you know, we're, we're starting to dabble a little bit with, with synthetic biology. But you know, um, whether it's food, whether it's artificial uh, or alternative fuels, whether it's alternative materials, another area that, that Mubad Al Ventures is focused on as well. Awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna turn it to the audience. So do we have any questions? Uh, I guess a uh, question for Andy and maybe the other folks. You guys quoted a lot of stats that were sort of uh, around primary direct investment and on the equity side. Um, I guess there's, there's an underlying current of other things that are like the fund to fund market, secondary funds, venture debt. Do you see those growing in emerging markets and do you have any data on what those areas look like? Yeah. Dave, I think that the, the the data is probably still pretty, you know, scarce in terms of uh, being available. But certainly, um, you know, I think this rising tide environment uh, would suggest that all those alternative uh, vehicles like venture debt is also on the rise in emerging markets. I know, for example, we were in India in um, December. There are now three venture debt funds operating in India with some discussion about a fourth and a fifth launching there. Uh, the first venture debt fund launched in Brazil. Uh, there's a venture debt, two venture debt funds that have started in Australia. So it's an at, it's a um, type of financing that's particularly appealing to family offices who like the sort of blend of some equity upside with uh, downside protection on collateral. So uh, while I don't have great data around that intuitively, I think uh, that's certainly on the rise. Yeah. Um, I think there is more data on that, and I, and I think there is a lot of secondary activity happening. Uh, we, we have our, um, in fact, my colleague uh, Tracy here, is, Tracy Fong is here as well from our capital team. We're, we're involved with Founder Circle, but uh, you know, as um, w with uh, the average age of companies uh, getting older and older, uh, IPO market much better this year, but still, and we'll see what happens in, in 20. 19, but um, the ability to get uh, secondaries has is, is gotten a lot more important. I think there's a lot of activity at that level. Other questions? So if you look at the emerging tech scene over the past couple of years, you, know, you see a lot of hype around certain things, you know, whether it's everybody switching out big data analytics for machine learning or you know, the big boom in VR and then subsequent kind of maturation. As you look at emerging technology, how do you distinguish between hype 
and real kind of impactful watershed change? And then are there any metrics that you follow, whether that's company formation or intellectual property, that help kind of signify that? I can take that. Um, uh, it's a great question, and I think there's a couple questions kind of to piece it apart. I think the first is um, there is this kind of valley hype cycle between whatever buzzy term is kind of out there, and certainly AI machine learning is a big one right now. Um, let me give you the other side of AI machine learning. The other side of AI is that most of these businesses don't have business models yet. And what do I mean by that? Most of these, you know, effectively serve as consultancies or kind of very expensive service operations without scalable technology kind of business to business. And so um, what's, what's interesting behind that is that some of the AI companies have been generally kind of founded out of universities with really, really smart teams. Um, and we kind of meet these teams and it's like super, it's turbocharged, but we're not stepping in early enough to take the risk that um, does this product catch on? So at least where we're stepping in, we need to see some of that traction on the product side, that there is a business model behind kind of all these smart people. And so um, there's two things, uh, kind of how we dissect that. The first is a lot of the AI companies don't turn out to be AI companies. They turn out to be, you know, high-end statistics at best that's kind of being run on a lot of companies. And we get hopefully some of our own AI companies to dig into this and help, uh, help us verify, you know, what are they actually basing what they're doing on? Is it real AI in some ways? Um, the second is, which doesn't take kind of a fancy science degree, um, is, is there a business model behind this, which, um, which is the easiest to kind of, uh, you know, understand. And so I think the advice behind all these kind of different hype cycles is, is first, um, yeah, there may be some benefit to kind of playing into that, playing into machine learning or AI or kind of fill in the blank. But the more important thing is, uh, I think by the time people do diligence and dig in, um, the question is, is there a business model kind of behind all of it? And um, most investors will kind of realize that in the mid to later stages, early on it's harder because they're investing behind the quality of the entrepreneurs and the quality of the idea without the product that's already there.